Hi everyone, welcome today to our second session of Confirmation. Today we're going to discuss scripture as well as creed. I hope everyone had a great Christmas and a beautiful start to the new year. This session is going to be a little different than the last one. We're going to begin this session in like a family discussion or a forum. Today we have Sister Yvonne and Mr. Mark Turnus. They're going to help us out and answer these questions for us. And when you're at home, answer the questions yourselves and work along with the, with the um, program. Um, so today we have uh, six major questions we're going to be asking. And they're designed to lay a foundation for the remainder of our discussion for today. So thank you for participating. And we're going to start with the first question. And the first question, and again, please ask these questions to yourself while you're at home. Who is your favorite saint and why? We're going to ask Sister Yvonne, since she's our great leader, to begin. Well, good day. Thanks for being here. Oh, my favorite saint. Well, you know, we have so many. Uh, we could pick any one any day of the calendar year, and some days have more than one, obviously. But um, I kind of thought about this, and I settled on St. Joseph. Um, Joseph reminds me of my own dad, because my dad liked to work with wood. So that, that carpenter as aspect. And since I looked up to my dad, I look up to St. Joseph. Joseph was a protector. Um, he took care of Mary, he took care of Jesus. We just had that story through the nativity. And I think going along with Joseph, I would also say the Blessed Mother. I am an IHM sister, Immaculate Heart of Mary. And Mary is one of our patrons. And so I've chosen Joseph and Mary as the saint that I wanted to share with you today. Now let's hear what Mark has. Hello everyone, welcome. Um, it's uh, no doubt in my mind, uh, there are so many, you're absolutely right, um, but uh, <clears throat> no doubt that uh, St. Michael is, is my absolute favorite saint. Now St. Michael is not a man, uh, he's not a woman, uh, St. Michael is an angel. He is actually an archangel. And uh, I, I look at uh, uh, images of angels in, uh, in uh, art, and they always seem to be these like fat little babies with wings, like sitting at the footstool of God in these paintings, etc. But um, angels are real creatures uh, that were created by God to serve him. And at a time when uh, the bad angels, for lack of a better term, uh, led by an angel named Lucifer, uh, rose up against God in heaven, uh, Michael uh, sounded his famous battle cry, and it was actually a, a, a battle cry, uh, Kiot Deus, and that's Latin. Sister probably knows what it means, but for you who don't, it means who is like God. So Michael stood up to Lucifer basically saying, you cannot try to be like God, no one is like God, and Michael drove Lucifer out of heaven and unfortunately into our world. Uh, the next time Lucifer turns up is in the, the story of creation. Uh, he's uh, tempting Adam and Eve. Uh, uh, because Adam and Eve, he's trying to convince them that they can be like God. And that's part of uh, original sin. Uh, so anyway, uh, Satan, Lucifer, prowls the world to this day uh, in a very real form. And St. Michael is out there uh, protecting me and reminding me uh, to, that my place is, is to serve God. And uh, I, I rely on him and pray to him every day. Thank you very much. We'll go on to question number two. Who is your favorite Christian hero? And what does he or she mean to you? And now we'll start with Mr. Mark Turns. Okay, thanks, Brian. Uh, I have a, a lot of uh, favorite Christian heroes. Um, you'll hear me talk about 
them. Uh, I know I mentioned one of them already in the prior session. Uh, his name is, is Bishop Robert Barron. Uh, he's a bishop in the San Diego, California area, and uh, he has a way of speaking to me that is, uh, uh, he can be talking to a huge congregation and I hear him like he's speaking directly to me. Uh, but uh, to be brief, uh, another, <clears throat> another he, Christian hero of mine, uh, actually there are a group of people, and they're called the Daughters of St. Paul. And the reason I really like them uh, is because uh, they started media and a new way of evangelizing years and years and years ago. They actually had a bookstore right downtown Cleveland near Public Square called the Daughters of St. Paul or St. Paul's Bookstore or whatever. And I remember encountering them. I, I, had, uh, I was preparing for a, a religious renewal and I had this song that I really wanted to use. And I walked into this bookstore and one of the sisters came up to me and she said, uh, can I help you find something? And I said, yeah, I'm looking for this song. And she said, who wrote it? And I'm like, I don't know. And she said, uh, who performed it? And I says, I don't know. <laughs> and she said, hum it. <laughs> and I have a horrible voice and I hummed this song and she began singing it right in the store. And she says, oh, the song is You Are Mine, and it was recorded by such and such. And I said, oh, really? I said, thank you very much. And I says, is that the only group that recorded it? And she said, no, we recorded it too. And I said, who are we? And she said, the Daughters of St. Paul. To this day, I have that version of that song. And in a way, they're, they're heroes of mine because of they started evangelization through music and media long before it became very popular. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. So, Go ahead, sister. Your turn. Okay. <laughs> um, when I think about Christian heroes, um, I, I think about some of the heroes I had growing up, which would be my parents, my grandparents, um, and the support that they always gave me in wanting me to be the best person that I could be. And then um, when I got out of high school, I joined a religious community, which I mentioned in the last question, the Immaculate Heart of Mary Sisters out of Monroe, Michigan. And I think now, um, kind of tagging along with what Mark said, many of the women that I have lived with over the years or um, worked on committees with them, or attended meetings with them. They have been models for me and helped me to um, come to realize what some of my gifts and my talents were. And so I, I would choose my own sisters as some of my heroes, my Christian models that I look up to. Thank you very much, sister. So our third question is, who is your favorite Bible character? Mm -hmm. And sister, we'll ask you to start again. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, I went to uh, a story in the Gospels, and it's the story of Martha and Mary. And um, many of you might remember this story. Jesus came to their house. He came, they were good friends of his. He was a friend of Lazarus, who was their brother. And when he arrived, Martha and Mary were there to greet him at their home. And Martha, being who she was, got very busy. And she was in the kitchen and making sure the house was prepared and Mary, her sister, sat down with Jesus, and she actually, uh, the way the story kind of reflects, she was sitting at the feet of Jesus, just sitting there quietly, listening to his stories, or just even being in his presence and not saying anything, just to be there, because he was so special, they were such good friends. And so I chose Martha and Mary because in Martha we see the importance of being the worker bee. 
but we also have to sit down and take time for prayer and for quiet and to be in Jesus' presence. And um, in the story, uh, Martha says to Jesus, you know, Mary needs to come and help me. And Jesus says, Martha, Ma Martha, Mary has chosen the better part. So he doesn't say that the work isn't important, but he's kind of reminding us, Jesus is reminding us, that we need both prayer and work in our life. And so that's why I chose Martha and Mary. Um, I'm pretty much a, I, I call myself a professed scripture junkie. I, I do read the Bible a lot. <clears throat> I have <clears throat> a lot of characters and a lot of favorite stories. One of my favorite, favorite Bible passages is uh, when Jesus meets Simon Peter. And uh, hopefully I'll have a chance to uh, uh, share a, a little reflection on that a little later in the pro uh, program today. Uh, but um, character-wise, um, King David. Uh, we all know King David is uh, an ancestor of Jesus, uh, and Jesus was referred to many times as Jesus, son of David. Uh, King David, if you didn't know this, is the very same David who slayed Goliath. Uh, in, uh, in the book of Samuel, the, the account of the slaying of Goliath and the, the description of David at the time it was just like a young shepherd, uh, probably the size of, of you sitting right there at home, uh, no bigger than you. And the giant was really, he was actually about six foot eight, uh, which was very, very large for people back then. Uh, so he was six foot eight, so you can imagine someone like the size of, of LeBron James uh, battling you. And, and uh, the, the comical, even comical part of the Bible story in Samuel is when David puts on the, all this armor, and again, like your size, and he's wearing this full-grown armor, and he's practically tripping all over himself because he's just like, I can't wear this armor. And he rips all this armor off, grabs his staff, and uh, throws his shepherd uh, cloak on, and <laughs> goes to do battle with Goliath, and we all know the end of that story. But I always found it very humorous. Uh, David is uh, my favorite character. He's, uh, he's a flawed person. And uh, we all know a lot of the later part of his life. He's a very uh, flawed man, but God always found favor in him. And uh, it's okay to be flawed, and God will always find fav favor with you as well. Thank you very much. And obviously our Bible characters are in what they call the Bible. <laughs> so to find out more about these Bible characters, we would read the Bible. Stay so, tuned. So, so, so how often and when do we read the Bible? And we're going to start with Mark. All right, well, you can see my Bible is kind of falling apart. It has been opened uh, several times. And uh, I, uh, again, am a self-professed uh, Bible junkie. I've read quite a bit of it. Um, I read it a lot to pray. Uh, it's a very, very... Uh, great way to pray. We're going to have a, a whole session on prayer, I think, coming up before we're done with all these sessions. Uh, so it's a great uh, tool. Um, I pretty much read it in the morning. Um, I don't, I'm not a real late night reader. I don't really like to read at night, but I kind of wake up a lot of times and I'll read it, and particularly through seasons like we've been through um, Advent and uh, the Christmas season and Lent in that season, it's really great. There, there's all sorts of meditation books that kind of take passages out of scripture, and uh, Bishop's uh, particular uh, hero of mine, Bishop, uh, kind of comments on them. So they're, they're called the Little Blue Books and the Little Black Books. And however you read scripture is, uh, is totally up to you, but uh, we're gonna talk about that a lot more. Sister? Thanks, Mark. Um, when I heard this question, I, it made me think of when I was first a member of the community. And part of our daily obligation was to read the Bible for 10 minutes a day. And unfortunately, it was 
pretty much an obligation. And I didn't really take too much advantage of it then because I was just doing what I thought I had to do. But now, you know, a few years later, um, I do read from scripture on a daily basis. And normally my reading of scripture is going along with the church. And that would be by reading the first reading, the psalm, and the gospel for the day. And so I have, um, at this time in my life, made those readings my, kind of my daily prayer. And, and um, some days the readings are a little tough, and sometimes I have to look around and see if I can find what somebody else has to say about those readings to help me to see how those readings fit into my life. But I would say now that, um, and Mark mentioned this too, that like following things that relate to the season, like we just had Advent, we have Lent coming. So following the daily readings is another way of doing that. Since I'm so much more high tech and everyone else, my mind, is right here on my cell phone. There you go. And I use the parish app. I have that too. <laughs> I use the parish app, and you can look it up, and you can look up different readings and scriptures, and whatever you like to find. Um, so it's a great thing, great opportunity, and I know everyone that's listening definitely has a phone or a computer to do this. All right, we're on question number five now. Who is the most influential person in your life's faith journey? And we'll start with Mark. Um, it depends on the time in my life. Uh, when I was younger, my, my father passed away 20 years ago. Uh, uh, so when I was younger, he, uh, he was a great role model to me uh, because his, his life was very difficult. Um, and. Uh, he fought through, he persevered, and he always kept his Christianity and his Catholicism in the forefront. Um, as I grew up and got a little older, <coughs> I think my, uh, my most recent uh, role model would be uh, a fellow parishioner. Uh, his name is Dave, and uh, Dave is a convert, so I, I'm a, called a, a Cradle Catholic, Catholic because I was baptized when I was uh, an infant. Well, Dave was baptized when he was an adult, so he consciously made the decision uh, to become a Catholic. And uh, I could go on and on about him, but the one thing about him that is so amazing is how well he listens uh, to anything, to a problem or a conversation. It could be a group, but Dave is always there just contemplating and listening. He's just got a great skill for that. A person that comes to mind for me is someone uh, who was, he was the pastor of a parish where I was working at the time. Um, I was an el elementary teacher. I was teaching eighth grade. And um, the pastor asked me if I would, well, actually he, had, he invited me to dinner because I was home alone that day. And so he said, let's have dinner. And we had another associate at the parish, so the three of us had dinner together. And in the conversation, uh, the pastor asked me if I would be interested in helping them with um, starting an RCIA program, which is the kind of program that uh, Mark's friend Dave probably was involved in, so that the adults could learn about the Catholic faith, and if it was right for them, they could join the Catholic faith. And uh, it was after Father Tony's invitation that I began to realize that the things that I um, found so important about being an educator and being able to help other people to learn things, I could apply in other ways. I didn't have to be in a classroom all the time. I could still be an educator. And which is very important to me as part of the IHM community. That's one of our, um, our ministries. 
And so, um, Father Tony really sparked that in me to begin working with adults. And um, I then went back to school and got a degree in ministry and have been at several parishes along the way. And here I am at Holy Family. And one of the things that I do for many hours throughout the year is I'm involved with our CIA. So, and that's that, that journey of walking with other adults and sometimes young people who are looking to become Catholic. Very nice. Okay, we'll go on to our final question. Our final question will be, where and how did your families preserve their memories? And Sister, do you want to start? Oh, sure, Brian, thank you. That's, that's a, a real opportunity. Um, I, um, when I think of memories, I think of pictures. And I guess it's because our family had so many pictures. Actually, I brought along with me one of the uh, memory books, you might, if you want to call it that. But this, this book took, um, well, it probably took 50 years in the making. It looks like. <laughs> Um, when when um, my parents were young, take, they not only uh, took pictures, but my father and mother developed the pictures. So they, they and this, this was all done on film. We didn't have digital cameras at that time. Um, my father had all the chemicals, he had the dark room, and then once they developed the pictures, they would print the pictures. And one of the, it's a favorite memory now, we didn't like it so much when we were kids, but every year, mom and dad would take a picture that um, well, was of the children. I have two brothers and a sister, I'm the oldest. So we had to, had to take these pictures. Usually we didn't start till almost the middle of December, so our Christmas cards would have not gotten there this year probably until the end of January with the mail system. But, um, and then my father would design the card and mail it. My mother would, you know, and he would make sure they got mailed. Design it, print it, and then send them out. And I think the favorite one, and I probably could say this for all of my brothers and sisters, is the one that looks like a camera. It not only looks like, or pardon me, like a television. It not only looks like a television, but my father designed it so that it had a, a wheel in it. And as you turned the wheel, a different picture appeared in the television screen. So that the, it, it, it's just kind of a unique card, different than anybody else would it ever send. And it's, it's a memory for me. Brian, do you have any memories? I do. How do you preserve your, how did your family preserve yours? Well, we preserve them definitely by video. Because oh. we have fancy cameras. He's younger than us. Yeah, he is. <laughs> yeah. So there's really two main ways. One is pictures, video, plenty of video to uh, bring out to embarrass my children at any time. <laughs> uh, the other way is telling stories. We tell the same stories over and over again. And I know it gets a little annoying to my children once in a while. But at the same point, I heard the same stories years ago from my parents and from my grandparents, and these stories have carried on over the years. So we preserve them by sitting around the table at dinner or having a game night or some event we're having with the family, and we'll bring up those old stories. <laughs> and sure enough, the kids go, oh, jeez, you're going to say that story again. And sure enough, I will. But then that's another way of preserving it. Remember, because that's how the Bible was originally compiled. They didn't have paper. They didn't have cameras. They didn't have internet. Who would have guessed back then? But that's how it began. It was by stories and telling stories and telling stories over and over and over again and they preserved those memories and now we have the memories to share. So that's, that's the end of our questions right now. Now why do we do the session a little bit differently this time? You know, it's really just a way to have more discussion you know, it's a little more interesting, 
and it's a little more real, it's a little more personal. Um, and hopefully this here will help all of you to, um, to have a better discussion with your parents. I'd like to siblings. add, uh, I'd like to yeah. add, if you haven't already, um, in, in your, on the confirmation tab in your journal, are these questions, all of them are, are, are mapped out. Um, we urge you to uh, find your parents, if they're not sitting right next to you, and uh, have these discussions with them. Uh, these are great discussions to have. It's, it's really kind of easy to do. Um, but have the discussion and, and, and maybe even focus on that last question a little bit because it kind of sets the stage, as Brian was mentioning, uh, about the Bible and, and, and capturing uh, memories and, and how you did it uh, might lead you to maybe a better, uh, fuller appreciation on how the Bible authors did it as well. So. I think uh, we could probably, unless you have anything to add, either of you, we could probably move on because we do have a... We could invite a, them to pause. Yeah, pa video. pause your video and maybe even have the conversation uh, before you uh, restart the video uh, if you haven't been maybe pausing along as, as we went. But definitely pause your video now and, and uh, take a look at those questions and then when you're done, turn it back on. We have some topics that we're going to talk about for the remainder of this session. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. We welcome you back. We hope that you were able to share and have some discussion among your own family members. And just keep thinking about that. What are those stories that Grandpa's been telling? Maybe we should start to listen to them. Now, we'd like to begin this portion by having an opening prayer. So I invite you to just get yourself comfortable, but sitting quietly. Calm your mind and your body. And we begin our prayer as we do all of our prayers in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. reading from Matthew. Learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, know that he is near at the gates. Amen, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. In this 21st century, if God could send us an email, it might be something like this. Dear child of mine, your world is changing. Not long ago, emails were new. Then came texts and tweets, and on and on. To your great-grandparents, the telephone was new. To your great-great-great-grandparents, snail mail was new. As new things develop, Old things pass away. All governments eventually fail. Even the earth and the sky will one day disappear. But my words in the Bible will never change. They always have and always will be true. They're just as relevant for you as they were for someone a thousand years ago. Circumstances may change, but truth is always truth. If you are relying on a new fad, a new drug, a new president, or some new technology to make you happy, you're going to be disappointed. 
But if you rely on the Bible to guide your life, you will never go wrong. My word doesn't change. You can count on it. Your everlasting Father, God. Let us conclude our prayer and please join me as I lead the final section. Glory to the Creator who makes the story. Glory to the Son who tells the story. Glory to the Spirit who inspires the story. Glory to God, three in one and one in three. Together may we share love's blessing forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So at this time, I'd like to share some things with you about the Bible, the scriptures. But I'd like to begin this part with a, a little story. Um, perhaps some of you remember when you first experienced a box of Kleenex. I have one right here. And not unlike this box I have was the box that you probably saw as a young child. And you took a tissue and miraculously another one popped up. Wow, you pulled it again. Another one came up. This was fun. And you might have even done something like the two-year-old alone in the room who discovered this fun activity of pulling up the Kleenex. What a surprise mom got when she arrived and there were Kleenex all over the room. Finding out about God in the Bible is something like using these tissues. There is a little of it showing just halfway, and when you see that using God's word is helpful, you begin to take it and use it. Of course, what is important is not only that you take or listen to God's word, but that part about using it. So we hear God tell us in scripture to feed the hungry. We use that word from God. We bring in food for the church and we find out how good it feels. Over time, we discover many lessons that God shares through the word God's word can be used for many things. And when we keep going back, the word is waiting. God wants us to love one another. God tells us that he will care for us and he will care for the sick. God invites us to take care of the earth. The more we use God's word, the more there is to use. That's the way God's word works. We listen, act on the word, and use it. And then go back for more, day after day, and year after year, one at a time. So, God's Word. How are we going to listen and then act on the Word and use the Word? Today, Mark, Brian, and I shared some stories with you about our families and stories that parents and other family members shared with us as we were growing up. Hopefully, you had the opportunity to share with your parents and do something similar. Storytelling is a way that we pass on family memories. 
And today we want to talk briefly about the Bible, a book of stories and memories about God and God's people. The Bible is divided into two main parts. And some of these things you're going to remember, they're going to be familiar to you. But let this be a good review for us. The first part of the Bible is the Hebrew Scriptures, or what we sometimes refer to as the Old Testament. Jesus' Bible is another way of referring to these 46 books. Many of the writings in the Hebrew Scriptures focus on the agreement or covenant between God and our Jewish ancestors in the faith. The New Testament, or Christian scriptures, is the second part of the Bible. And similar to the Hebrew scriptures, we see a central theme of covenant or agreement, an agreement between God through Jesus and his people. The Christian scriptures are a collection of 27 books and the basic theme of Jesus Christ. That's what the Christian scriptures are all about. Of all the teachings, the miracles, the events in the Bible of Jesus and the life of Jesus, the most dramatic event that was witnessed by Jesus' followers was his death resurrection. These are the events that surrounded what we now refer to as Holy Week and Easter. And it was around these events that the early Christians used their based their faith. It is probable that the story of Jesus' death resurrection was the first story of the New Testament to actually be recorded or written down. Jesus' teachings and the events of his life made sense to the early Christians only after the resurrection. So the Bible is made up of these two distinct parts, 46 books in the Old Testament, Hebrew scriptures, and 27 books in the New Testament, Christian scriptures. We need to remind ourselves that this book we call the Bible is not really a book, but rather it's a collection of books. It's a library. And like the books of any library, they've all been written over a period of many years and in a variety of literary forms. So when reading a book, a story, an article, a magazine, a newspaper. It's helpful to know when it was written and who was the audience. For whom was this book intended? This enables us to understand the writing in context. So as we stand in the story of our Kleenex box, you only see a part of the tissue sticking out. So, too, with God's Word. We must look at the context and listen to the message that is there for us at the time. <clears throat> we might ask ourselves, what truth or lesson do I hear? What are the author's intentions? What is the intention of the church? The scriptures are our story, the story of God dealing with his people and the story of our Christian family. <clears throat> so if someone in the 23rd century were to find a copy of a book or story or something written that was dated 2021, this 21st century, we would hope that they would know enough not to read everything as though it was equal or the same in style, purpose, and content. And so it is with the reading of the Bible. Various books were written at different times in history by different people 
and for different reasons. So reading the Bible requires work. Another name for this work is prayer. In order to learn the meaning and how it relates to us right now in the 21st century. So even though the Old Testament was written over a period of 900 years, think of that, 900 years to write down what we have in the Old Testament, the Israelites' people's experience of God. So we begin with what's called the Torah, or the Law. This is composed of five books. They're the first five books in the Bible of the Old Testament. So first they ha we have the Law. The next group of books are called the Historical Books. These cover about a thousand years. They were uh, from around 1225 BC to about 135 BC, before the birth of Christ. And next we have what's called wisdom literature. The chief purpose of these is instruction. And the Song of Songs is a love poem. And the Psalms, these are a collection of song lyrics. And finally, we have the prophetic books. These are writings not to predict the future, but to speak of God on the issues of the day. And like the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Christian scriptures, they too came to us over time. For the first 20 or so years after Jesus died and rose, nothing was written down. How were the stories of Jesus passed on? The stories were repeated and passed on from one group or person to another. We call this oral tradition. Consider what happens when stories are repeated in this manner. Details are changed, some things may be added or some things are left out, Eventually, Christians began to realize the importance of preserving their heritage in writing. So, don't be afraid of the Bible. Don't be afraid to read the scriptures. Let God talk to you through the words that we call the Bible. I invite you to let God's word take root in your life. Learn to listen to the word, to act, that is, live God's word, and then to go back for more. What is the Bible? You could say it is looking at our poster here, basic instruction before leaving Earth. Knowing the facts and the stories related to the Bible, this is important. But more importantly, you have to live the Gospel. For it may be the only Bible that some people will read. At this point, I want to um, ask you to take a look at the top of page two of your journal pages and thinking about what we have talked about this morning or this day, uh, I would invite you to complete your written responses on those couple of scripture reflection questions. <coughs> Thank you, sister. Uh, today I'm going to show you how easy it is to open scripture. That wasn't it. I did open the book. 
But that's very important because to open any scripture passage, the first step, as Sister just said, is don't be afraid to open the book. Uh, I'll share a couple of thoughts and then I'm going to share a, a passage with you. And the passage is included in the confirmation tab. Uh, it's just uh, titled Matthew chapter 4. So if you wanted to print that out, you could read along with me. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier on, one of my heroes uh, was the uh, bishop who wrote the little, the little blue books, the little black books. His name is actually uh, Bishop Ken Untner. And he had a, a couple of things that he, he thought about reading scripture. And the first thing he said, it sounds a little deep, uh, but it really isn't. He says, reading scripture is not simply information, but formation. God shapes us through his words. The second thing he said is really important, I think. He said, don't skim. We're taught since we be first began to learn to read, to, to read fast, get through those books. The faster you read, the faster you're done with your homework, whatever it is. But Bishop says, read slow. Let the Lord speak his words to you. The third point's a little bit more difficult. I'm going to try to demonstrate it. It may or may not work. It works a little better when we're live. Uh, but I'm, uh, and it's just, um, <clears throat> I do this a lot when I read scripture. And it's basically um, putting yourself into the scene of what you're reading. I did it with, uh, with the story of David uh, that, I, that I talked about, being on that hillside in that battle. Uh, but the, the reading I chose today is Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. Not many words at all in there. And uh, I'd like you to just please pay attention, maybe read along, but come along with me and uh, we'll see if we can open this scripture up, or at least I can show you uh, what this passage says to me. So if you uh, take out your reading, <clears throat> it is Matthew chapter 4. As he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon and his brother Andrew, casting a net into the sea. They were fishermen. He said to them, come after me, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. So if you come with me in this little adventure about what that very short passage says to me, uh, I'm going to put myself into the scene. You can if you'd like to. So I'm going to picture myself on a, on a bright sunny day walking along the Sea of Galilee. And the Sea of Galilee is actually not a sea, it's a lake. It's a very, very large lake about 12 miles from Nazareth. So I'm walking along this large freshwater lake, maybe in the town of Tiberias, which is on the west coast uh, again, about 12 miles from Nazareth, and I see him. I see him walking along. Uh, there's a lot of people. It's bustling. There's people coming in from fishing all night. There's people going out to fish. There might be a market going on, people buying fish, so fishermen trying to sell their fish. It's a very bustling place. And two things strike me as I'm walking along this day. It's here where Jesus meets Simon. It's here where he calls Simon. He doesn't call him in his dream. He doesn't call him at the synagogue. He doesn't call him in a beautiful, quiet garden. He calls him at work. Simon Peter is working. He's just getting done or just getting ready to fish. The, the passage says they were casting their nets. They're actually physically working. And Jesus gets right in his face while he's working and he says stop come after me and i will make you i can make you a fisher of men a great line indeed so again i'm at the scene so what do i see from that what does that say to me jesus takes simon for where he's at at work uh maybe he's sweaty it's hot maybe it doesn't smell so good maybe it smells like fish maybe he's in a grumpy mood he didn't catch anything or whatever, he could be in a bad mood, but he takes him for where he is at. He doesn't say, hey, meet me at the synagogue later and I can give you all this information. So Simon was a fisherman. It's a tough job. He was a tough man, 
And Jesus in his face said, I can make you better. I can make you a fisher of men. I can make you everything God wants you to be. So I think about that. I think about that line and what does that say to Simon and what does it say to me? Jesus is calling me the same way. I can make you a better person. I can make you the best person you can be. He's not saying, hey, Mark, you can make yourself great if you do this and this. You can make yourself. I can't make myself anything of value without him. But he can make me everything God wants me to be. So those are just a couple of the things that the passage kind of spoke to me by putting myself into the scene and kind of uh, seeing how Jesus meets Simon, how he reacts with him, and what he says to him, uh, and how powerful that is to me. Now, uh, I just opened that passage, and that's what it said to me today. Um, I can read that same passage in a week, and it could mean something totally different, basically based on where I'm at with my life, where I'm at in my journey. Something different might stri strike me at that time, and that's the beauty of Scripture. Just like Jesus and Simon, Scripture meets you wherever you're at in your life journey. The point is, wherever you're at, wherever I'm at, Scripture can reach out to you. But always remember the very first step is to not be afraid to open the book. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We're going to move to our second topic for today, the creed. And I would invite you to take your uh, journal again. And we're going to go to part, the second part on page two. It's titled, I Believe. And I'm going to ask you to just take a minute or two to write down what you believe about God the Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and the Church. Now just think for a minute. You're a baptized Christian. You were baptized into the Church in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. As a baptized Christian, what do you believe about God the Father? God the Son, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Church. Just a couple words. You may need to pause, and then we'll go on. Thank you for doing that. A belief statement is called a creed. And what are some of the things you believe about the Father, Son, Spirit, and Church? There are many ways you could have responded. These could be the beginning of your belief statement, your creed. We also refer to the creed as what we say the profession of faith. So a creed is a short way for a person or community to express what they believe. The word creed comes from the Latin word credo, and credo means I believe. So when we say credo or I believe, we pledge our loyalty to something or someone. An example of this is when we say the Pledge of Allegiance. We express our belief and our loyalty to our country. The Pledge of Allegiance is like a creed. And every time we say it, we are promising to be good Americans. We pledge our loyalty to our country and what it stands for. When we say the creed during Mass, we are expressing our faith in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And in the creed, we also express our belief 
in all that the church believes and teaches. Over time, the words used by Christians to express their beliefs have changed. Even though words are, were changed or added to the creed, the beliefs have always stayed the same. When the church was very young, the creed was very short. It may have been as simple as, Jesus is Lord. But as the church grew, church leaders added other statements, and the, the creed also grew. So we have two prayers which express what we as Catholics believe. The Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed is the prayer that we usually use during Sunday Mass. Every Sunday, all around the world, Catholics profess the creed in various languages. And when the creed is translated into any language, the person who is doing the translation always begins with the same Latin words that other translators use. This is helpful to, so that Catholics around the world all express our one faith in God and the Church. I'd like to point out some of the words in the Nicene Creed. We began using the present translation during the Advent season of 2011, and I invite you to follow along. You'll find this in your journal. It's on page 3. And it's the bold-faced words that we're going to be focusing on. The first are, I believe. The creed begins with I. The creed is the faith of us, the community. But when we say I, each of us takes responsibility to proclaim our faith together with other believers. I make a promise or a commitment with the rest of the assembly. Of all things visible and invisible, some things are visible, though we may not be able to see them. For example, grandparents or other relatives who maybe live across the country or a parent or friend who is serving in the military in another part of the world, they're visible to the people where they live and work, but they are unseen to you. Your great-great-grandparent was visible once upon a time, but now is unseen. We believe that God is the maker not only of things we can see, but also of things that are, in fact, invisible. Another example, angels. Only begotten. This means that we believe that Jesus is one of a kind. We believe he always was. He did not start when he was in Mary's womb. He was always the Son of God. We hear these words again in the prayer that we pray, the Gloria, the only begotten. Born of the Father before all ages, it is clear through the use of these words that we believe that Jesus lived with the Father before time began. Consubstantial. This is a big word that means that Jesus and his Father are one and the same God. Jesus is not like any other human being because he is human and divine. Incarnate. This word means to be given flesh. We believe that the word Jesus became flesh in the womb 
of the Virgin Mary. Suffered death. We believe that Jesus really died on the cross. Because Jesus really died, we know his resurrection is real. In accordance with the scriptures, these words help us remember that the resurrection was talked about in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. They also remind us that scripture plays a very important part in our faith. Adored. We believe that God should be respected and highly praised in a way proper only to God. I confess. In the creed, the word confess means to profess belief in. When we say, I confess, we are saying we believe with all our heart. I look forward to the resurrection. When we say this phrase at the end of the creed, we are saying that we are really sure that we can live with God forever. So the next time you pray the creed at Mass, take time to say and think about the words you are saying. Make it a profession of your faith in the Trinity and in what the Church believes and teaches. Join your prayer with Catholics all over the world. <coughs> Thank you, Sister. Um, as we wrap up this session, I, I, I have a few things here. There's a, a, we've talked today about three or two of the three critical components of our faith. We talked about the creed, and we talked about the Bible. Well, I have both of them here, and I've also brought a prayer card. This is the Mass Prayers and Responses. So the two of the three, the creed, the Bible, and the Mass, are two of three very critical components of our faith. Our faith in all salvation history, from the very beginning of time to the end of times, is harmoniously dealt with by all three of these components. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me show you uh, the harmony as I see it. So I'm going to conclude here with a personal reflection. Um, you probably know how the Bible begins. The book of Genesis, and it's the book of the creation of the world. Now, God actually speaks the world into creation. God said, let there be light, and so there was light. God said, let there be fish in the sea, and so it happened. God said, and so it happened. It's repeated in this beautiful, poetic poem version of the story of creation. Now, we know there wasn't a, an individual person sitting on a rock at the time writing all this down because there were no rocks yet, and there certainly were no people yet at creation, yet we have this beautiful poetic version of the creation of man, or in the creation of the world and the creation of man. If you haven't read that story, that beautiful uh, poem of creation, I, I really urge you to do that. It's maybe a great, great way to start reading the Bible. But back to my harmony theme. So the Bible begins with the story of creation. And how does it end? The Bible ends with the book of Revelation, which is really the story of end times. A new heaven and earth, a new Jerusalem, uh, where God is seated, Jesus at his right hand, uh, ruling forever in end times. So the Bible begins with creation and ends with end time. Okay? Let's take the creed. How does the creed begin? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. The creed begins with creation and our belief in creation. How does the creed end? I believe, I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The creed ends 
with a, co a confession of end times, how we look forward to the second coming end times. So very much like the Bible, starts with creation, ends with end times. So then I compare that to the Mass. Okay, the third very, very critical component. Uh, the Mass was uh, referred to as by Bishop Barron as a privileged encounter, and I love to uh, uh, think of the Mass as that, that we are very privileged to be able to encounter God. But I have the prayers of the Mass. How does the Mass begin? After a very quick opening blessing, our first prayer, I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that what? That I have sinned. It goes right back to the beginning of the Bible, it goes right back to the beginning of the creed, the, the, uh, the creation story, the fall of man. And how does the Mass end? The Mass ends, in a way, kind of abruptly. Uh, after communion, the priest washes the, uh, the vessels on the altar, he washes his chalice, and we just disperse. He says a blessing and we just disperse right after communion. And what is communion? It was documented, clearly expressed, um, by, uh, I don't know who actually, I think it's Bishop Theron. Um, it's, uh, the Eucharist is the meal that even now anticipates the perfect meal of fellowship with God. So we start with a confession of our sins from the beginning of time, and we end with the meal anticipating the fellowship with God in heaven. It's perfectly in harmony, it's perfectly aligned, let all three of these components be a large part of your life. Thank you, Mark. So the next time we're at Mass, we have quite a few things to think about and try to see how all of this is fitting together. I'd like to uh, take some time now to just uh, explain for you what it is that you are to do at the conclusion of this video and um, the assignment that you will return to me. Uh, there are four main parts in the Creed and they talk about God the Father, God the Son or Jesus, God the Holy Spirit and the Church. So think about each of those four parts, Father, Son, Spirit, Church and think of a symbol that could uh, stand for each of those, either the, the, the three persons in one God or for the church. For example, the Father, as we talked about, he's the creator. He had no beginning or no end. Or Jesus, we think of Jesus as the, the nativity, we know Jesus died on the cross, he's our savior, he rose from the dead, he's sometimes called the light of the world. Or the spirit, what is it about the spirit? How do you represent the spirit? We know we've used a dove, we've used fire, the color red is important when we talk about the spirit. In our last session we talked a lot about the church, so the church is being united in baptism, uh, the fish is sometimes used as a symbol for the church, and there are many others, I know, and some you can create your own. So on your journal page, you're going to create and color a symbol for each of the sections of the creed, and then go back to those words you put down about what you believe, and write your own belief statement and what you believe about God, who is Father, Son, and Spirit. And then finally, of course, sign your page and return it to me. And just to help you, I have a little sample. Okay. So there, your, your page looks very similar to this. It's lined up. Father, Jesus, Spirit, Church. You need a symbol for each in the circles. And then on the lines in the middle, write your own belief statement. 
This was a statement that I wrote. So you can use your own words and your own ideas and the things that touch your heart about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the Church. As we come to an end, I would invite all of us to pray together the Apostles' Creed, which is the other creed that we said really contains all about our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for your participation. Have a good day.